Hello, I am Mary Christina Wood, Professor of Law at the University of Oregon School of Law and author of Nature's Trust, Environmental Law for a New Ecological Age. This is a bedrock lecture on human rights and climate change, and my topic will be atmospheric recovery litigation, which is an approach to making fossil fuel companies pay for cleaning up the atmosphere that they polluted. It is often said that the common law should respond to the felt necessities of the times. At this moment, we have no choice but to match law with our reality, because we now face an all-out climate emergency. I will describe atmospheric recovery litigation as a response to this climate emergency. It is geared towards forcing a cleanup of the atmosphere to be funded by the very fossil fuel companies that have profited enormously from developing and marketing the fuels causing greenhouse gas pollution. Let's begin by stepping back to assess our position in this moment in human history. It is as if we live in a minute glass, slipping between two worlds, the world we knew that supported our survival with a stable climate system, and a world looming ahead in which the climate system becomes so disrupted that we face the prospect of an uninhabitable planet. Even in our position between these two worlds, we witness devastating catastrophes and chaos from the carbon pollution already in the atmosphere, and scientists warn that if we continue on this path, we will destroy the life systems on Earth that are crucial to our survival and our children's survival. At this momentous point in human history, it would certainly be important to have a world leader who would guide us into a global plan to address this emergency. In the wake of World War II, for example, Secretary of State George C. Marshall announced a global plan to recover the economies of Europe so as to support democracy. He unveiled this concept in a commencement speech made at Harvard University on June 5, 1947, and it changed the course of the world. But we have never had a leader for our crisis. At the time President Obama was in office, his lead science advisor, Dr. John Holdren, said, The current situation of the world in relation to the climate problem is that we're in a car with bad brakes driving towards a cliff in the fog. Well, we are all trapped in the back seat of that car, and now we have a president in the driver's seat who is flooring the gas pedal, careening us towards that climate cliff. President Trump has stated his intent to develop $50 trillion worth of coal, oil, and natural gas. So at this crucial moment in time, we have to step back and ask, what does our planet need to recover climate stability? Scientists say we must decrease the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to below 350 parts per million. That represents the upper limit of the safety zone. But we are now beyond 400 parts per million, and that number keeps rising. Scientists emphasize the need for a two-part response. First, we need to decarbonize our society as rapidly as possible, achieving zero emissions by at least 2050, and the sooner the safer. But decarbonization alone is not enough at this point because we have already exceeded the safety zone, and the surplus carbon up there in the atmosphere is already wrecking havoc with our climate system, causing the ice masses on Earth to melt and the seas to rise and killing marine life and harming communities all over the world. So the second necessary measure is cleaning up existing excess carbon in the atmosphere. We have to accomplish a drawdown of this carbon. In essence, we have to clean up the sky. Scientists point to four natural methods available to jumpstart this drawdown recovery effort. All of them use the natural power of soil to stimulate plant growth and absorb carbon dioxide and store it over predictable time frames. Methods include reforestation, wetlands and mangrove restoration, regenerative agriculture, also called carbon farming, and regenerative grazing. The idea is to boost the ability of the soil to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. In other words, through natural methods like replanting trees and adopting organic and no-till farming practices, the soil itself can be a major engine for jump-starting the cleanup of the atmosphere. But to catalyze this global effort, we need a legal strategy simply because no one is in charge, not the legislative branch, not the executive branch. When the other two branches fail, there is only one branch remaining, and that is the judicial branch. Courts are the constitutional guardians of the fundamental rights held by citizens, and courts can be called upon to catalyze action in the other two branches of government. So the legal strategy on both sides of the climate imperative turns to the courts to motivate action. On the decarbonization side, 
there is mind-blowing urgency and very little time left to act because there are dangerous feedback loops and tipping points that, if passed, would send our planet into runaway heating. In June 2017, the former UN climate chief announced to the world that we have only until year 2020 to push down our emissions curve irrevocably, or we will not be able to attain the goals of even the Paris Climate Agreement. The legal strategy designed to force governments to decarbonize is called atmospheric trust litigation, and it is now in full swing and gaining tremendous momentum. The strategy is based on the public trust principle, which is an ancient doctrine with roots dating back to Roman times. It's pretty simple to understand. It says that those crucial natural resources that are imperative for our survival, like air and water, are held in a perpetual public trust, an earth endowment, so to speak, to be protected and maintained for the enduring benefit of citizens today and tomorrow, and for those distant generations who will need those resources no less than we do today. Government is charged as a trustee of the resources with the fiduciary duty to protect this natural wealth for present and future generations, and the citizen beneficiaries can enforce this duty in court. The public trust principle is well established throughout this country, as well as in many countries around the world. In May 2011, the Atmospheric Trust Litigation Campaign was launched to enforce this duty of protection towards the atmosphere and climate system, both of which unquestionably are crucial to our collective survival. This campaign was brought in the wake of wholesale statutory failure to address the growing climate crisis. Administrative petitions and lawsuits were brought on behalf of youth in every state in this country against their governments, asserting that those governments are trustees of the atmosphere and waters and other crucial resources, and as such, these government actors have the duty to prevent substantial impairment of the climate system. These legal actions seek enforceable, science-based plans of carbon emission reduction. In other words, the campaign positions the courts to supervise the other branches of government to do their job as trustees. The historic campaign was spearheaded by Our Children's Trust, a nonprofit organization based in Eugene, Oregon, with partners around the world. Since those cases were filed, similar cases have been filed in other countries around the world. In 2015, as part of this campaign, Lawyers for Youth filed a federal case in the District Court of Oregon on behalf of 21 youth plaintiffs against the federal government. The complaint filed with the court chronicles the history of U.S. fossil fuel policy, which our government promoted over decades despite growing warnings by scientists as to the danger it would create for those of us living today and beyond. The complaint alleges that by pursuing such fossil fuel policy, defendants have acted with deliberate indifference to the peril they knowingly created. The case is Juliana versus United States, and is called by many the biggest case on the planet because it challenges literally the entire fossil fuel policy of the United States and names multiple federal agencies as defendants. It advances two claims. One asserts that government has violated a constitutional duty owed to citizens under the federal public trust principle to protect our crucial resources and climate system. The second set of claims asserts that government violated the due process clause of the U.S. Constitution by pursuing a fossil fuel policy that would threaten rights to life, liberty, and property. This case, too, requests the court to order the federal government to prepare an enforceable, science-based climate recovery plan addressing both decarbonization and drawdown. On November 10, 2016, the 21 youth plaintiffs gained a sweeping victory when the Federal District Court of Oregon handed down an opinion affirming both the public trust and due process claims and denying the government's and industry's motions to dismiss the case. Judge Ann Aiken wrote, I have no doubt that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society. And as to the public trust, the court found that it was an attribute of sovereignty that imposed a duty on the federal government to protect public trust resources. This duty, the court held, could not be legislated away. The court said that the trust duty both predates the U.S. Constitution and is enforced by it. This Juliana case is now scheduled to go to trial in late October 2018. The trial is anticipated to last 8 to 10 weeks, and it's referred to by many as the trial of the millennium because the gravity addressed by the climate evidence is profound. Literally, the court will hear evidence 
showing that fossil fuel policies threaten our ability to survive on this planet. This trial will mark the very first time in history that the U.S. fossil fuel policy will meet climate science head-on and in court. And meanwhile, our children's trusts and partner organizations are filing more ATL state cases, including one just filed in Florida, and cases in other countries as well, including India, and the strategy aims towards the green judicial domino effect around the globe, in which courts throughout this country and in other countries will step up at this 11th hour and force the other branches of government to act in time to slash carbon before we push our planet past that point of no return. And so in summary, we've reviewed atmospheric trust litigation, which is a global legal strategy in full swing, to force governments to decarbonize their jurisdictions according to a pace set by the best available science. These lawsuits are brought on behalf of youth against their government trustees. But again, there is another side of the climate imperative, which is drawdown, the cleanup of excess carbon already existing in the atmosphere. The legal strategy calibrated towards drawdown is called atmospheric recovery litigation, which envisions a lawsuit by one or more government trustees against the major fossil fuel companies to finance essentially a global cleanup of the sky. Again, scientists envision jump-starting atmospheric cleanup through natural soil-based methods, the ones we discussed before. But there's one big problem. There's no one in charge of leading such a drawdown effort. There are many scattered localized efforts around the world, but there is no concerted strategy for deploying these methods at the scale and pace needed. When the legislative and executive branches fail to act to protect our survival resources, there is a dangerous vacuum of leadership, and legal strategies must turn to the third branch, the courts, to catalyze necessary initiatives. The atmospheric recovery strategy envisions an approach that can be depicted as three gears moving in conjunction with one another. The biggest gear, as you see, represents an atmospheric recovery plan. We need a global cleanup plan to organize the worldwide effort of drawdown. There's tremendous science showing the capabilities of soil-based drawdown in different ecosystems and using different methods, but there is virtually no framework that takes those ideas and creates project parameters and financing mechanisms and unifies them into a global undertaking. This plan anticipates a global strategy unfolding in two phases. The first consists of domestic projects within the United States, but actually the second phase is the larger undertaking. It supports drawdown projects internationally, outside of the U.S., where the lion's share of drawdown potential is located. I want to make clear that this strategy does not engage offsets, which are arrangements whereby polluters are allowed to pollute if they purchase an increment of conservation or drawdown somewhere else. Compliance offsets are very problematic because they basically legalize continued pollution. We have to phase out fossil fuel pollution and fully decarbonize. So soil-based drawdown must aim towards cleanup of the legacy carbon that already exists in the atmosphere. There are tremendous benefits of soil-based drawdown projects on the local level. They enhance food and water systems, create resiliency against some of the worst effects of climate change, like flooding and drought, and also these methods create local jobs. We're talking about putting foresters and farmers and ranchers to work, cleaning up the atmosphere while actually repairing their own local ecosystems that have been ravaged by climate change. And so now we need to find a way to finance this atmospheric recovery plan. So we look to the Top Gear, which depicts a lawsuit brought against the fossil fuel corporations to force them to pay for cleaning up the atmosphere that their fuels polluted. This legal strategy borrows the very same logic that is used every time there's an oil spill in the ocean. After the BP Deepwater Horizon catastrophe, there was no question that BP would have to pay for the cleanup of the oil, and the same is true for any other spill. Government trustees sue the responsible corporation and gain natural resource damages to finance the cleanup. The atmospheric recovery litigation approach takes this well-established process and applies it to the sky, envisioning a lawsuit against the carbon majors to fund an atmospheric recovery plan. So who are the government trustees that can bring suit against the fossil fuel corporations to finance cleanup of the atmosphere? The atmosphere is held in trust among sovereign trustees across the world, and any co-trustee can take the lead on holding corporations accountable for cleanup. So for example, states and counties, tribes, and foreign nations are all sovereigns positioned to bring suit. 
You will notice that the federal government is not listed. It is, of course, legally positioned to bring a suit, but will obviously not do so when President Trump is in office. But we are still left with a robust set of sovereigns, any one of which could take the lead. So let us now turn to the likely defendants in this litigation. They have been identified as a result of a breakthrough study completed a few years ago by the Climate Accountability Institute, which found that nearly two-thirds of the carbon dioxide emissions since the 1750s can be traced to about 90 corporations, most of which still operate. These large fossil fuel companies have come to be called the carbon majors. Now, the claims in atmospheric recovery litigation are a bit distinct from the claims that could be used to force cleanup of oil spills in marine waters. Statutes expressly provide for those claims, but there is no statute covering cleanup of carbon dioxide pollution, again, because the legislature has not acted. So the sovereign plaintiffs would rely on common law tort claims like public nuisance and their public trust authority. Recall that the Juliana Court and several others have affirmed the sovereign's public trust duty to protect the climate system. And in Oregon, the state has taken a public trust approach in suing Monsanto Corporation for cleanup of PCB pollution in Portland Harbor. This suit is brought by the state in its capacity as trustee of public trust resources for all Oregonians. And now back to the three-gear approach. Let's turn to that third gear labeled the Sky Trust. The monetary damages gained from the lawsuit against the carbon majors would be placed in an independent but court-supervised administrative body or trust, which would finance, manage, and oversee the drawdown projects. An appropriate model is gained from the Volkswagen litigation and settlement, where the parties set up a court-supervised trust to administer funding for projects to draw down nitrogen oxide, a pollutant that was released as a result of the faulty Volkswagen devices. There are several recent cases that paved the way for carbon major liability. Several cities and counties in California have sued the fossil fuel companies seeking disgorgement of profits to fund seawalls, infrastructure repair, and other costs of adaptation. New York City has filed a similar lawsuit, and most recently the claims have moved inland as Boulder, Colorado, and two Colorado counties filed suit for adaptation costs as well. But there is a big problem with these lawsuits. There is not enough money in the world to pay for all of the damage unleashed across this planet by the fossil fuel industry. What are these other damages? They are likely incalculable and growing exponentially. They include loss of life and property, economic losses, relocation expenses, infrastructure damage, and secondary natural resource damages. Building seawalls and repairing roads won't do anything to fix our global climate system, but it will drain the profits of the fossil fuel companies. We need to fund, first and foremost, atmospheric recovery in order to treat the underlying pollution syndrome that is causing all of these other damages. There is also an environmental justice concern emerging as cities line up to sue the fossil fuel companies for their adaptation damages. The ones who get to the front of the line stand to be compensated, while the disadvantaged communities that are not positioned to sue lose out because, again, there's not enough money in the world to pay for even a fraction of the damage to communities worldwide. Until we fix the problem, the death toll from climate instability will continue to mount. There's one liability case pending now in California in which the court clearly signals a judicial understanding of this enormous problem and has endorsed a role for the federal judiciary in addressing it. In California v. BP, Judge William Alsup stated, if ever a problem cried out for a uniform and comprehensive solution, it is the geophysical problem described by the complaints. The scope of the worldwide predicament demands the most comprehensive view, which in our American court system means our federal courts and our federal common law. And he also said climate crisis demands to be governed by his universal rule of apportioning responsibility as is available. Judge Alsop also did not shy away from the complexity of climate crisis. He ordered the parties to provide a tutorial early in the litigation so that he could become familiar with the scientific underpinnings of the arguments. So in sum, the carbon majors are already defendants in liability cases brought by sovereign co-trustees. If the damages sought in those cases turn to atmospheric recovery, the legal gear could indeed catalyze a global atmospheric cleanup and recovery effort 
necessary to reclaim a climate system that can support our collective survival. A prospectus for this three-geared legal strategy is available on my website on the link at the bottom of this slide. And so in sum, in confronting this global climate emergency, we know this. The level of our ambition must match the scale of the problem. In face of the vacuum left by the executive and legislative branches, a practical legal strategy must turn to the courts to catalyze necessary action. I will leave you now with a quote from Dr. James Hansen, formerly the chief climate scientist of the United States. He wrote in support of the children's lawsuits, Judicial relief may be the best, the last, and at this late stage, the only real chance to preserve a habitable planet for young people and future generations.